Welcome to the Bird Podcast. I'm Shobha Narayan. Ornithologist and author Scott Widensall celebrates the natural world, particularly birds and bird migration in his research, his writings, and his public speaking. Scott is a polymath who does a number of things, field research, writing acclaimed books, lectures, and leading specialized tours. But his real calling has to do with bird migration. His detailed bio and links will be posted in the show notes section of this episode, but we are delighted that Scott has taken the time to talk to us. Welcome, Scott, and thank you. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Shoba. It's a pleasure. Um, Let's dive right in. Um, I loved your book, and you have written lyrically about the migratory migratory feats of birds. Uh, For someone who hasn't read your book, can you give us an overview of why bird migration fascinates you so much? Ah, well, because birds do astonishing things. I mean, we have we have birds moving over almost every square kilometer of the planet, with the exception maybe of the central Antarctic plateau, but everywhere else on Earth, there are birds. And many of them are migrant species that are traveling thousands of kilometers, tens of thousands of kilometers every year. We actually don't know what the limits of bird migration are. Every time we think we understand that we know how far birds can migrate and what kind of physical feats they can undertake, the birds kind of blow right past those assumptions. I mean, just within the last few years, scientists have discovered that that several species of swifts from Europe spend as much as 10 months a year in continuous flight. Basically, after they leave their breeding grounds in Switzerland or Sweden, all their migration to Africa the entire time in, in in the northern winter when they're in Africa and on their return for 10 months, they never set foot on ground. They're constantly in powered flight. So I don't really, I don't think we really know what the limits of bird migration are. And I find that, I just find that fascinating. And the other thing I I have always been riveted by with migration is the fact that, you know, I, I grew up in the Eastern United States and twice a year, migratory birds brought the entire Western hemisphere through my backyard. Birds that had wintered as far south as the Southern tip of South America and were on their way to the high Canadian Arctic you know, from places as remote and seemingly exotic as Bolivia and and Ecuador, heading to places like Greenland and Nunavut. Um, You know, for a 12-year-old kid growing up in the Appalachian Mountains of Pennsylvania, as I was, that was pretty heady stuff. And I got hooked on migration at a very early age. There's this uh, lovely passage in your book where you wake up um, do not disturb your wife, and then you go out in the pre-dawn darkness or just after dawn, and then in your garden are all these birds, or you see it and there's birds sitting. I think, um, and you say that if people wake up at night and see that you use technology like a Doppler thing, you said, but the, every, <laughs> you said, I wish people yes. knew how what's happening up above us. Really, because I think people don't understand the staggering number of birds that are aloft in the night sky. Most birds, even those that are normally active by day, migrate after dark. The the, the night air is cooler, it's moister, so they're not at risk of dehydration. It's less turbulent, there are fewer predators. So you have literally billions of birds aloft in the night sky during the peak migration seasons. And and people are completely unaware of it. There's this, this cascade of birds passing over virtually every every house here in North America, and people are sitting inside watching television and paying no attention to it. And if you could strip away the darkness and see it, I think it would be one of the greatest natural spectacles on the planet. Do you think someone will build an, build an app for that? After I read that section, I said, gosh, I wish I had Scott's technology to, to see this. <laughs> well, um, actually, they have built an app for that. It's called the Doppler Weather Radar System. And in, in places where um, Doppler weather radar is, has, is, is used, depending on how the, the radar f- data are filtered, because, you know, meteorologists don't, they call it bio clutter. They don't like the fact that insects and bats and birds show up on radar. That gets in the way of, of communicating, you know, the, the, the weather data they're trying to get. So in some places, like, for example, in Canada, they filter all of that out. And so you can't see the the birds on Doppler radar. But in the United States, you can. We have 143 Doppler radar sites 
across the lower 48 states. And you can go on the National Weather Service's radar and, and actually see these, these blossoming nebulous clouds of green and blue just after dark as hundreds of millions of migratory birds are rising up into the night sky. And from a, from a science perspective, the Doppler radars that are being used in many parts of the world now, are, it's a form called dual polarization radar, and it's extraordinarily sensitive. It was designed to be able to tell the difference between ice crystals and raindrops and snowflakes. And so you can actually tell the difference between small birds and medium-sized birds and large birds and distinguish the beak end of the bird from the tail end of the bird. So scientists can actually calculate with high precision exactly how many birds per cubic kilometer of airspace are traveling through the night sky. And when you put all of this together, and the numbers are just phenomenal. A few years ago in Pennsylvania, where I used to live, we did a study where we were using um, a different kind of radar, more like the kind of marine radar you'd have on a boat, and forward-looking infrared cameras. And we were trying to study owl migration, and it was a great idea, but it didn't work. But what we were able to do that night was determine that over about a 30-mile stretch of ridgetop where we were working in eastern Pennsylvania, birds were passing at a rate of about 2 million an hour. And this was very late in the migration season, far after the, the peak of the migration. If we'd done it a couple of months earlier during the peak of the fall migration, it would have, I'm sure it would have been six, seven, eight million birds an hour. So just to, and that's, and there's nothing unusual about that spot. I think across, across much of the, the, the Northern hemisphere and the Southern hemisphere where, um, and particularly the Northern hemisphere, where you have the largest numbers of migratory birds moving, moving out of South America, Africa, and Southern Asia. The numbers are just staggering. The book is A World on the Wing by Scott Widensall. It's the, glo the subtitle is A Global Odyssey of Migratory Birds. And one of the lovely things about this book is that the guests I interview typically specialize in a region, except um, specialists in bird migration like Scott Widensall. They imitate birds because they don't have borders. They go everywhere. So um, Scott, um, Talk to us about uh, some of the fascinating spots in your book that you visited. I mean, the Yellow Sea comes to mind, but uh, which were some things that touched you? Which were some areas? Well, and in fact, you've, you've, you've touched on an accusation. Um, I, I have been accused by my friends and family of writing books that give me an excuse to travel to places that I would otherwise love to travel to. And there's a little bit of truth to that, I have to say. But yes, that's one of the, you know, one of the great things about studying bird migration is you get to follow the birds. And the birds go to amazing places. You mentioned the Yellow Sea between China and the Korean Peninsula, which is the linchpin of this huge East Asian, Australasian flyway. So it's drawing migratory birds, particularly migratory shorebirds, that, you know, waders as they're, as they're known in, in many parts of the world, from places like New Zealand and Australia and Oceania and, and Southern Asia, and funneling them up through this narrow waist of the, of the flyway to the Yellow Sea, where you have, you know, what, what, what at least were the world's largest and most expansive mudflats. I mean, when the tide goes out at a place like Dongling, north of Shanghai in China, it goes out 20 or 30 kilometers. So these are enormous mudflats. And so you have these shorebirds that have just flown, in many cases, 6,000 miles nonstop. And they'll land in the Yellow Sea and they'll feed ravenously for several weeks and they'll double their weight and basically fill up their fuel tanks again and then fan out from there um, far to the, north, to the northwest up into... Um, uh, Russia and parts of Eurasia far to the northeast. Some of them will go to the Russian Far East or actually across the Bering Strait and into Alaska and parts of Western Canada. So it's this, it's this huge hemispheric system. The, the problem with the, with the Yellow Sea is that particularly China and South Korea have destroyed an, um, a, a majority of their tidal flats, they, what, these mud flats on which these birds depend. They've walled them off with seawalls. They've filled them in to create dry land. And it has squeezed these birds into smaller and smaller areas. And as one conservationist told me, it is really at this point a birds per hectare equation. For every additional hectare of, of mudflat that's destroyed, there are birds that lose their lives because they simply have no other place to go. 
you know, just to, you know, one, one really grim example, um, a few years ago, South Korea built a 21 mile seawall across uh, an, about 150 miles, uh, 150 square miles of really rich tidal flat, walled it off from the sea and destroyed it. A fifth of the world's population of great knots depended on that site as their main stopover uh, location when they're migrating. A fifth of the world's great knots disappeared after that. And it's not like they went somewhere else. They, they, uh, they almost certainly died. So in, what happens in the Yellow Sea is critically important for the conservation of millions and millions of shorebirds that are migrating across almost half the world. The good news here is that just a few months before my visit in 2018, I was there in May of 2018, the Chinese government did what totalitarian governments can do sometimes, which was they made this sweeping declaration banning all further commercial development um, along the Yellow Sea shore in China, basically a secession of all of this coastal destruction. And it has, it has come just in the nick of time. Uh, the Chinese have also nominated a large number of the most important sites for UNESCO World Heritage Protection, which uh, UNESCO approved in 2019. The Chinese actually have, I, I believe, nominated another 12 sites more recently that are under UNESCO consideration. So these are, these are concrete steps in the right direction, but they really come at the 11th hour. And it's, it still remains to be seen whether it's, it's, it may be, you know, whether or not it's too little too late. Um, India and China, uh, at least among naturalists, we tend to compare India and China. And India has 4% of its land mass under protection. But it looks like China swung one way, but now it's really making strides in uh, conservation. Would you agree? Well, and I, th I think, and, 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 I, and I suspect part of the reason that the Chinese government made that decision was they recognized not just the environmental value of these, uh, of these mudflats, but also the economic value. There are millions and millions of Chinese uh, residents that depend on shell fishing in these mudflats. In fact, one of the places that I visited in Nanpu in, in the Bohai Gulf in the Northern Yellow Sea, um, you know, the mudflats that were, that were being used by the, by the shorebirds, there were also local fishermen that were going, going out there in their, in their you know, hip boots and waders and, and harvesting shellfish. So it's a rich exo ecosystem that supports not just birds, but also people. Um, one of the points that I learned from your book is that shorebirds are the real heroes of migration because unlike seabirds, they cannot sort of drop in and, and feed. Uh, they make these uh, epic migrations. Would that be oh, correct? Ab oh, there's no question about that. I mean, in fact, really the most epic migrations of, of, of any land bird, because you're right, you know, a, a, a tern or a shearwater or a species like that, they can feed at sea, they can rest at sea, they can drink seawater and filter the salt out with special glands in their heads. But a shorebird, a wader like a sandpiper or a godwood or a plover, they, they're not waterproof. <laughs> they can't rest on the water. So when you have a species like a bar-tailed godwit that breeds in western Alaska and spends the winter in New Zealand or Australia, the only way it can make that migration is to spend seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven days in continuous powered flight, never, never stopping for a moment, never resting, never gliding, but you know, and, and crossing the widest part of the Pacific Ocean, something like eleven thousand kilometers, and and do it essentially in one great leap. And they can do this because migratory birds can change their bodies in dramatic ways before and after their migration. They can essentially, many of them can reorder their internal organs. Um, and bar-tailed godwits, again, are a great example of that. Before they leave Alaska in late August and early September, they undergo a, a phenomenon that's fairly typical of migratory birds. It's called hyperphagia. It, it basically, it's binge feeding. They just, they just eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat. And they'll more than double their weight in a couple of weeks. By the time they've, they're ready to migrate, they are 55% fat. They jiggle when they walk. <laughs> they are squishy if you pick them up. And so they've gained as much weight as they possibly can. And so they no longer need their digestive organs, so they get rid of them. In a matter of a couple of days, their stomach, their intestines, their kidney, to a lesser extent their liver, shrinks dramatically. They atrophy. And even as their digestive organs are shrinking... Their, their flight muscles, the pectoral muscles in their chest that power their wings, increase in mass by about 
and their heart muscle increases 30 to 50 percent. And they do that without exercise. I would very much like to be able to increase my muscle mass without exercise. Thank you very much. And then they make this incredible flight to Australasia. They land, regrow their guts again, spend the austral summer feeding in New Zealand or Australia. And then when it's time to migrate to the Yellow Sea, they go through this whole process again, balloon up in weight, their guts shrink down, they make the flight, they land in the Yellow Sea, they regrow their guts, they feed again, their guts shrink down, they fly back to Alaska. They do this over and over again, several times a year, and they'll do this for 20 or 30 years. By the time a bar-tailed godwit dies, it will have flown the distance from here to the moon and most of the way back again about wow. 18,000 miles a year. And then there's also a section where you, I don't know if it's this bird, but I remember you talk about how uh, they grow the sexual gland, the, the testes in, in, was it this species or some other species? Uh, well, actually, interestingly, most birds undergo a, a really dramatic, uh, among male birds, a really dramatic growth of the testes during the breeding season and then a dramatic shrinkage. And that's particularly noticeable in migratory birds, why, you know, why carry a, and by the way, I say a testy because um, generally speaking, it's only, it's only one. They, they, they've, um, you know, to, in order to save weight, you know, a male bird really only, usually only has one gonad. The female usually only develops one ovary, usually the left ovary. And yes, these things expand during the breeding season and then, and then shrink down. In the case of the, the testes in, in birds, it's like one one thousandth of its breeding um, breeding period size so you know these it, 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 this business of organs growing and shrinking and growing and shrinking is is really common among birds and it's a great way to save weight when you don't need it and there was this lovely passage in your book about the arctic song of the red knot so i didn't realize the song changes when they go towards their nesting ground oh yes well, well i mean shorebirds most people don't think of shorebirds as singing um you know, because because so many shorebirds breed in really remote Arctic regions, most of the birders who see them see them on passage or or during their non-breeding season, and they're not singing them. But yes, many species of shorebirds have elaborate songs and this elaborate song flights where they red knots, for example. I mean, they breed in an area where there are no trees, so the the sky is their perch. So they take off and they make these. They fly these big elaborate figure eight um, song flights, and they're pouring out this kind of melancholy, plaintive, three-noted sort of a poor wee, poor wee call. Um, but bar-tailed godwits have, a, have a, a, a flight as well. The male has what's known as a limping flight, where he has kind of a stuttering pattern as he flies, and it flashes these silvery white underwing linings as he's, as he's singing his song. And it's all about you know, displaying for the female and setting up a territory and chasing away, chasing away mates but, or chasing away rivals. But, you know, not, not something that we normally, we birders normally think of as shorebirds and waders doing. Um, even a, no, a novice like me knows, has heard of Arctic terns as the sort of the kings of migration. But in your book, you debunk a bit of that. I mean, of course, the Arctic tern is fantastic, but you say that there's very little we know about migratory birds, and even that is changing. So the research keeps moving. Um, and then you talk about shearwaters too in that chapter. Um, can you talk about the changing research? You say there's always a but when it comes. <laughs> there's always a but. That's that's for sure, uh, right? Because I, you know, so this is actually the the second book I've written, extensive book I've written on bird migration. I did one back in the in the 1990s called Living on the Wind, and at the time. Arctic terns were considered to be the world's long distance migrants, and they are, as it turns out. But we didn't know that directly because Arctic terns, they're, all, they're only about the size of a dove. And the tracking technology that we had in those days was, was insufficiently small to put on a bird that size. So all we could do was, well, we know Arctic terns breed in the highest latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere. We know that they winter in the highest latitudes of the Southern Hemisphere and the Southern Ocean. Now you start drawing some lines in a map and, okay, maybe they're, they're flying maybe 22,000 to 25,000 miles a year, which is remarkable, but that wasn't a direct measurement. Well, in recent years, tracking technology has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller, and we now have devices like little light-sensitive geolocators that can go on a leg band that will essentially give us, an op give us the ability to calculate the latitude and longitude of that bird every day during its trip. Now, you have to wait until the bird comes back and you can 
take the data logger off of it and get the data back. But when we actually started doing that, a, a good friend of mine named Ian Stenhouse was one of the first people to do this. And he discovered Arctic terns from Greenland are traveling as much as 47,000 miles a year, not 22 or 25,000 miles a year. And then somebody in, in the, on, on the northeastern coast of the U.S. in Maine did the same thing with terns there, found they were going 51,000 miles a year. And then somebody did that with Arctic terns in, in Denmark, and they're doing 57,000 miles a year. Um, you know, and Arctic terns also winter in the Pacific Ocean, which is a very much larger ocean than the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans. And we suspect that the ones that winter there probably travel even farther. So, you know, at, at every step of the way, every every new technology opens, it's like peeling an onion. There's always a new surprising layer inside. And every time we think we know what's going on, something comes along to show us that we, we were once again underestimating what these birds can do. Um, in, there's uh, in page 23 of Scott's book, there's this wonderful passage and I'm hoping he can read a section of, about uh, how each migrant is ordinary and extraordinary. But while he finds that section, I want to tell you a lovely phrase that he uses. It's, uh, he says, migrating birds do feats that beggar the imagination. And um, um, Scott, if you have the, have it ready, would you read it? Otherwise, I'll sure. pause. Sure, I'd be I'll be happy to. I have it right here. Um, and and yes, you 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 mentioned earlier. This is I'm, I'm talking about a, an early morning when I got up during um, the autumn migration at our our former home in Pennsylvania in the Appalachian Mountains and uh, going outside to see what was happening. And I should also I should also preface this by saying that. Um, one of the species that I study in Alaska with the National Park Service is the gray-cheeked thrush, which breeds in um, spruce forests across the northern part of North America and winters in the jungles of South America. In the dim shade of the pines, where night seemed to linger, I saw a cautious movement near the ground and raised my binoculars. The wet-on-wet watercolor breast and umber plumage of a gray-cheeked thrush came into view. The bird eyed me suspiciously a few yards away and gave a quiet alarm call, but necessity drove it. Apparently deciding I was the lesser of evils, it turned its back to scuff in the needles, looking for its first meal after 12 hours of exhausting flight. Pale tips on the covert feathers of its wings told me this thrush was a juvenile on its first migration. It was probably born in the spruce woods of Newfoundland or northern Labrador, a continent away from those we tagged in Alaska. But I was gripped by the same urgent desire to know it as we had come to know those Denali thrushes, not as a here-and-gone distraction, one among a multitude of migrants on a busy morning, but as an individual, a singular creature with a singular and extraordinary life. It was an utterly ordinary, extraordinary bird, as is every migrant that makes the leap into the void, guided by instinct, shaped by millions of generations of toil and savage selection, crossing the vaults of space through dangers we cannot comprehend, by lucky chance and near calamity and great endurance on the strength of its own muscle and wings. For eons uncounted, that has always been enough, but no longer. Now their future, for good or ill, lies in our hands. Well, that says it all, actually. And uh, and there there's there's a passage where you imagine yourself to be one of these juvenile birds, and they're making their first passage across the Pacific, and you think, are they? Uh, please talk about that. You wonder right, about. Right. So, right. So these are the bar-tailed godwits that I was talking about before, and and I've I've been privileged to be able to watch bar-tailed godwits on their breeding grounds in the in the remote, wet, soggy tundra of western Alaska, and I've sat there. At the you know watching the nest of a bar-tailed god with a female sitting on the sitting on the nest and, and watching her through a spotting scope and imagining what it must be like when her chicks take off and make their first migration across the Pacific Ocean they do it entirely on their own or with small flocks of other young birds mom and dad actually abandon them before they're even fully able to fly and make their own migration and I I, I couldn't help but wonder you know as as this young godwit is laboring day after day, night after night, across the Pacific Ocean as these unfamiliar stars of the Southern Hemisphere um, come up in the night sky, you know, what's going through their head? I mean, are they, is there doubt? Is there exhaustion? Um, or, or is there just this certainty that they are doing what they have to do at that moment? And I suspect it's the latter. 
I suspect they are simply driven by this compulsion to fly in a certain direction for a certain length of time. They, they have no conscious notion of what's waiting for them on the other end. But the, it, it shows how, how far apart in many respects we are from, from some of the other creatures that share this planet with us, that they can do these astonishing things and, and do them with, with seeming ease. And we don't, we don't really, you know, it's, it's, it's impossible for us to put ourselves in their skins, however much we try. At the end of the day, I am a, I am a, a, a poor primate stuck on the ground, and they have the, they have the wind in the sky at their command. I'm going to read the list that you say. Um, you talk about birds changing every single aspect. Um, you ch and then I, I'd love for you to elaborate. For example, you say it's not a marathon. It's more like an elite, uh, uh, what is that, French cycle race? And no, anyway, I'll, yeah. So um, the, the, he says that every single aspect of itself, um, the bird changes every single aspect of itself, such as speed, endurance, memory, brain function, metabolism, disease immunity, blood chemistry, and much more. If you can pick any or all of these and just tell us how they change. Um, well, sure. I mean, birds are often compared to athletes. We, we, people often say, oh, you know, birds are extraordinary athletes. Comparing a bird to a human athlete insults the bird. <laughs> no matter how good a human athlete is, they are, they are, dis, they are, they are, distinctly secondary to a bird. For example, you, you mentioned Tour de France cyclists. You, know, I, I, you could argue that a male Tour de France cyclist is probably close to the pinnacle of, of an elite human athlete. I mean, they, they're operating at such an extraordinary high level. So a Tour de France cyclist is operating at about four or five times his base metabolism, his resting metabolism. And that's only possible with regular hydration, they've got to drink a lot of water, with regular food, they've got to eat a couple of times a day, and they can only do it for a relatively short period of time, they, you know, basically, you know, sun up to sundown if they're really pushing themselves. On the other hand, a little sandpiper, like a semi-pomated sandpiper, real common um, Western Hemisphere species, they weigh about, you know, 45 or 50 grams. They're going to travel, they're going to take off from the northeastern coast of North America and fly 3,300 miles nonstop to the northeastern coast of South America. That's the equivalent of a human running 126 consecutive marathon races and doing it with no food, no water, and no rest. And they're operating not at four or five times their base metabolism, but eight or nine times their base metabolism, which is already much higher than a human. I mean, a, a, a bird has a much higher base body temperature, they're burning fuel at a much higher level. Now there is, I, I, I joke that there is one similarity between these little semi-pomated sandpipers and at least some Tour de France cyclists and some elite athletes, because the sandpipers um, will stop off in Eastern Canada on the Bay of Fundy, where the Bay of Fundy has some of the largest tide, some of the highest tides in the world. So when the tide goes out, it's like the Yellow Sea, there's these enormous mud flats. And in the mud of the Bay of Fundy are tiny little crustaceans called corophium. And corophium are really high in omega-3 fatty acids, which dramatically increase the aerobic capacity of the bird's muscles. So basically what this bird is doing is using performance-enhancing drugs before it makes its, its migration, kind of like some, some cheating human athletes, except what the bird <laughs> is doing is not, is not illegal or unethical. Yeah, um, and life or death. Unlike human athletes. Yes, yes, it, it, it certainly it certainly is. Um, you know, so there, I mentioned before about how they can dramatically increase their their um, their muscle mass before they take off. It's 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 interesting. You know, these birds become so fat. I mean, they're really obese when they're ready to take off. Um, uh, some some physiologists have pointed out that their blood chemistry looks like a human being with diabetes chronic heart disease and morbid obesity. And yet the birds are ready for, you know, this extraordinary physical feat rather than going to the ER. Uh, 
Um, and, and, you know, think about those bar-tailed god, which, which get so huge before their migration, and then they shrink down. It's almost like they go from being a sumo wrestler to a skinny little runway model from a fashion show, to a sumo wrestler, to a skinny little fashion model. And they do that over and over again. Well, in humans, we call that yo-yo dieting, and it's really damaging to our heart. Doesn't seem to bother the birds at all. Um, birds are able to basically turn off half of their brain at a time. You know, if they're, if they're flying for days or weeks, or in the case of those European swifts, months at a time, they have to be able to sleep. And if they go completely to sleep, they're going to fall out of the sky. So what they do is what's known as unihemispheric sleep, where for a few seconds at a time, they'll turn off one side of their brain and let it go to sleep, while the other side of their brain, the other half of their brain is still functioning. And they'll just keep flipping back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, you know, 5, 10, 12 seconds at a time. And it keeps their brain fresh. It keeps them functioning fully. But even if you prevent them from undergoing unihemispheric sleep, even if you force them to stay awake, when birds are in migratory condition, they don't suffer the, eff the effects of sleep deprivation that we do. Now, Shoba, I study owls. I spend a lot of time at night in the woods losing sleep. I suffer from sleep deprivation every year. I would love to learn how to <laughs> avoid sleep deprivation. It's probably biochemical. And as with a lot of these, um, a lot of these tricks and adaptations that migratory birds have evolved, human physiologists are really interested in figuring out how the birds do it and can we replicate that in people. Um, one bird that uh, is dear to us here in South India is the bar-headed geese, and you mentioned that as well. Wow. So in your list, uh, I got the speed, the endurance, the metabolism, disease, disease immunity, I, I haven't gotten, memory and brain function somewhat I got. So can you use bar-headed geese as an example to illustrate what they do? Sure. So bar-headed geese, along with a couple of other species like ruddy shell ducks and some of the cranes, just simply fly over top of the Himalayas every year. <laughs> you know, it, probably because their migration route predates the mountains. I mean, the, the, the Himalayas are a young mountain range, relatively speaking, and they've probably been flying north, you know, toward the Tibetan Plateau and, and up into, into parts of northern Asia since before the mountains started to rise. And every year the mountains get a little higher and they go over top of it. But of course, you know, for a human to climb up the side of Everest or K2, you have to spend weeks acclimating to higher and higher altitudes. You have to use supplemental oxygen. You, you know, you run the risk of, of death from things like pulmonary edema. And yet, bar-headed geese will take off from essentially sea level in southern India and fly over the mountains in one long nonstop flight. You know, they're, they're climbing, many of them climbing at a rate of about 3,200 feet an hour, in some cases as much as 7,200 feet an hour. And so you know, think about some poor, some poor climber who's been, you know, laboring up the side of the mountain for weeks, just dragging one foot in front of another. And they look up and over overhead, maybe, maybe not effortlessly, but with a whole lot less effort than them, are passing flocks of bar-headed geese. And the reason that they can do this is because any bird, any off-the-shelf bird, has a dramatically more efficient respiratory system than any human being. We, we have what's known as a tidal respiration system. We breathe ear, air in and exhale it out the same passageway. So we only get, what, you know, 10, 12, 15% of the oxygen from each breath that we take. Birds, on the other hand, have a much more complicated respiration system. Their lungs are connected to a complex series of air sacs that run through their body, actually, in some cases, into their bones. And each breath that a bird inhales, it takes four respiratory cycles for that breath to move through this entire system of lungs and air sacs. So the bird is able to extract more than 90% of the oxygen from each breath that it takes. And bar-headed geese have an even more dramatically efficient respiration system than most birds. They also have a much more efficient form of hemoglobin in the blood for capturing the oxygen and transferring it to, to the cells throughout the body. They seem to be immune to the effects of pulmonary edema. We don't really know why. Birds in general seem to be more resistant to, to pulmonary edema than, than mammals, but bar-headed geese um, and ruddy shell ducks seem to be exceptionally resistant to it. So again, I mean, 
human physiologists would love to understand how to how to mimic some of these um, defenses and abilities and adaptations that birds have in in the human body. What is the most mind blowing discovery about bird migration? That uh... <laughs> Well, there's two. I think I think the the thing that I've alluded to a couple of times here, the fact that common swifts and alpine swifts and and other species of old world swifts basically don't land for for seven to ten months a year on their migration on the wintering grounds is just staggering. If those birds figure out how to incubate eggs on the wing, they'll never land again. Uh, you know, they're just they're about as as wholly aerial as any vertebrate um, probably has ever been. Um, the other thing that I think is really striking, we have, we've, we've wondered for many years, I mean, as far back as the 1850s, we've wondered how birds are able to navigate using the Earth's magnetic field. We've known since the 19th century that birds can sense the Earth's magnetic field. Well, when, I was in, when I was in college in the 1970s and, and took an ornithology course, we were taught that birds have little deposits of, of magnetic crystals called magnetite in their brain. And we, the, the thought was that this sort of functions like a compass, you know, pulls their nose to the north. Well, it turns out those really aren't crystals of magnetic iron. They're part of the bird's immune system. It has nothing to do with navigation. But birds do have this magnetic sense. And we've known for a long time it's connected to vision somehow. Well, only recently, within the last eight or 10 years, have scientists been able to, to show that birds are using a form of quantum physics known as quantum entanglement, which is such a strange form of quantum physics, it made Albert Einstein queasy. He did not like it. He called it spooky action at a distance, and it made him very, very unhappy as a physicist. Well, this is the same form of quantum physics that promises unhackable quantum computers and the potential for faster than light speed communication. But what birds are doing basically is it's it's allowing the birds, w without getting too deep in the weeds on this, there's, there are pigment molecules in a, in a migratory bird's eye called cryptochrome. And when the cryptochrome molecule is struck by a photon of light as the bird is migrating through the night sky, it knocks an electron out of that cryptochrome molecule and into an adjacent cryptochrome molecule, and it, and it links them in what's known as a radical pair. And, and it also makes them magnetic. And so whatever affects one molecule instantaneously will affect the other. Now, under quantum theory, if those molecules are at different ends of the universe, what affects one will instantaneously affect the other, which is, that's why Einstein did not like this idea at all. But what's happening in the eye of the bird is the bird is flying through the Earth's magnetic field. These pigment molecules are creating this constantly shifting palette of pigment in the bird's eye that allows it to, to, to see, to visualize the Earth's magnetic field. Shoba, do you know what I would give to see the Earth's magnetic field? It, it, must, it must be extraordinarily beautiful. And, you know, any, any random bird, you know, flying through the night sky can see it, but we can't. Um, which brings me to my next question is that uh, one of the themes of your book is that every uh, with bird migration, everything we find out overturns previously known things. So, for example, you talk about forest fragmentation. Can you tell us what's the latest and what has been overturned? <laughs> sure. Yeah, I, I quote I quote my mother, who is a very wise woman in this. She said, you know what bothers me about scientists? Scientists always say we used to think, but now we know. <laughs> and of course, you know, the, the point of science is we used to think, but now we think, you know, everything is, everything is always open for revision. So yes, I mean, you touched on, on forest fragmentation. I mean, here in North America, there's been a lot of focus over the last 20 or 30 years in, in migratory bird conservation on the importance of preserving large, intact, contiguous blocks of forest for many species of birds that evolved to nest deep in those forests. I mean, that's what much of, especially the forests of Eastern North America looked like in pre-colonial times, pre-settlement times. Well, it's, it's true that, that these birds do need large, intact, unbroken forests for nesting, but it turns out as soon as their chicks leave the nest, many of these species will move them into um, early successional forests, thickets, places where the trees have been cut down and what's grown back has been this jungle of, um, of, of, of new early successional thicket growth. 
those are those are areas where there's lots of food there's lots of insects there's lots of fruit there's lots of berries and that's where these young birds will bulk up before they make their first migration you know what we're realizing we need to do here in north america i mean uh, if you're depending on how how familiar your listeners are with the history of this part of the world in the in the from the late 18th century through the 19th century almost all of the forests in eastern and northern north america were cut to the ground and they've grown back in a very even age kind of middle aged forest that has very little structural complexity to it and so a lot of the complexities that those that the birds need this combination of really deep old mature forests and young thickets and emerging you know old regenerating meadows and f- wildfire burns and you know that that kind of mosaic of of complex structure that was there originally is gone and so what we need to do now we we increasingly realize is recreate that structural complexity we have to do it artificially through forest management but we can do it and it can make a big big difference for the birds but you know that's what i'm saying now that's that's our understanding of the science now 20 or 30 years from now we may have a still more intricate still more nuanced understanding of of what birds need um, you know, science is constantly evolving, and as you get more new information, um, you have to be prepared to walk away from what you thought you knew in the past. Um, one of the guests in the podcast uh, is uh, Dr. Umesh Srinivasan. He works in the eastern Himalayas in Arunachal Pradesh, and he talks about primary forests and how uh, cutting down forests and planting them without thinking about what trees changes yes. the sector structural complexity exactly what you what you just said um but you visited uh, that neck of the woods to spot uh, more falcons oh i did and that was easily the most spectacular part of the all of the research that i did for this for this new book um spent time in in nagaland with the uh, the amur falcon migration and i'm speaking here shoba as somebody who has always loved raptors i got hooked on migration as a as a kid watching the, the migration of raptors down the Appalachian Mountains. I've traveled all over the world chasing some of the biggest raptor concentrations on the planet. I have never seen anything to compare with the, the annual gathering of Amur falcons in Nagaland around Pang Ti and some of the surrounding communities. To see hundreds of thousands of falcons rising at daybreak from their, from their nighttime roosts and this rushing of wings overhead like the rushing of water uh you know it was it was absolutely a high point of my 62 years on this planet i can tell you and um i'm you know one of one of the things i am most anxious to get back to see i'm really hoping to make it back to nagaland um this year we're we're hoping to bring a group from from the United States, a small tourism group in there to try to support the local conservation work that's going on in, in that part of Nagaland and hoping yeah. that, uh, hoping all of our friends in, in Nagaland and, and elsewhere in India are okay, because I know things are not good right now with the pandemic. Correct. We, us too, yeah. And Banu Haralu, who you write about in the book, is yes. a kind of a rock star in that field. Um, <laughs> oh, she is. I, I, there, there, are, there, are, there are certain people that I've pretty much deified, and Banu is one of them. Um, I always ask my guests um, what are their favorite bird species, but uh, with you, you you say in your book you love wimbrels, but but you've been everywhere, so pick a few and well, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's 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 always hard. I have to I have to confess I have um, one of the groups of birds that I have worked with most closely over the last twenty five years or so are owls. Um, some of the migratory owls that we have in North America. And um, one of them, if you'd asked me this question any time up until about seven or eight years ago, I would have answered unhesitantly. My, my favorite bird is the northern saw-wet owl. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's about the size of a soda pop can. They weigh about 80 grams, big yellow eyes. Uh, they, they breed in the, in the spruce forests of um, northern North America. They migrate at night. Um, I have, I've been running a, a, a banding a ringing program for about the last 25 years in Pennsylvania. We've banded about 12,000 of them. When we started, everybody thought they were very, very rare. It turns out they're not rare. They're just rarely seen. And they're just incredibly appealing little birds. But I have to tell you, about eight years ago, 
I started working with snowy owls, which are big and dramatic and charismatic and magical. Um, you know, it's a little slice of the Arctic coming coming down into southern Canada and the northern United States. We've been putting uh, GPS GSM transmitters on snowy owls and following their winter movements. And over the years, we've tagged about ninety of them. And I, there's there's almost nothing I've done that quite compares with with trapping and handling and then following after we've, we've released it one of these snowy owls and following them all the way back to the arctic and seeing what they're doing in the summer breeding in some of the most remote places left on the planet um so yeah but the fact the fact of the matter is if i'm being perfectly honest my favorite bird is whichever one i happen to be looking at at the moment um, I, I had the privilege of seeing um, three Indian eagle owls three days ago on a trip oh. around Bangalore in, the, in a rocky area. So I kind of get it, but I want to hear you say it. Why do, you, why do we love, why, do we, why are we fascinated by owls? Why do you think that? Because some, some part of it is folklore, some part of it is, some part of our soul is affected by them. What well, do you I think? think I, I think a significant part of the reason why we're fascinated by owls is they remind us of us. I mean, think about it. Owls have big round heads and forward facing eyes, and some of them have ear tufts, but many of them don't. They look rather human. And I think to an extent, we see ourselves in them much more so than other birds. And so that's one of the reasons that I think that people have projected so much onto them. As you said, you know, there's, there's, you know, owls are are probably the focus of more folklore than any other single group of birds in the world. Um, often, you know, negative folklore, you know, the, the notion that if you hear an owl at night, it means that somebody's going to die, or if you hear the owl call your name, you're going to die. But, but also, I just think because we're, we, we recognize ourselves in them. You know, also, a, a lot of cultures consider owls to be extremely wise. Well, that's definitely projection. <laughs> we, that's definitely us projecting ourselves, what we think about ourselves on them. I mean, owls, on the avian scale of intelligence, and I know you've spoken to Jennifer Ackerman um, about the genius of birds. Um, you know, on the avian scale of intelligence, owls are not particularly bright as we measure intelligence, but they are very, very good at being owls. Hmm. Um, a, a friend I went with uh, for seeing these eagle, Indian eagle owls, Deepa Mohan, who is also going to be in the podcast, she said they are ruthless hunters. Um, would you say that of uh, snowy owls, which I have not had the privilege of seeing? Um, yes. Yes. I mean, all owls are. In fact, these little tiny sawwood owls that I was telling you mm -hmm. about, whenever people come to visit us at our banding station, they go, oh, it's just so cute. And I, sell, I tell them, not if you're a mouse. If you're a mouse, this is your worst nightmare. Yes, they're, they're tiny and they look appealing to us, but they're ferocious predators. Mm -hmm. And even the smallest owl in the world, the little elf owl of the American Southwest, which is about the size of a sparrow, mm -hmm. they tackle venomous scorpions and venomous centipedes. That's what they eat. I mean, they, you know, owls in general kind of punch above their weight. And so snowy owls, which are among the largest owls in the world and are incredibly fast on the wing. They actually often hunt more like falcons than they do owls. And they'll take, they'll take birds up to the size of Canada geese, which outweigh them probably three to one. Um, large herons, you know, the size of a, a, our great blue heron, the size of a gray heron. Um, and, and, but they're small, they're fast enough and agile enough to catch small songbirds in flight. So they're really extraordinary, extraordinary hunters. Um, a guest in this podcast, uh, uh, J.N. Prasad, it builds nest boxes and he's trying to get people in Bangalore um, building apartment communities like the one I'm at um, to have nest boxes for owls because instead of using pesticides, he says you have a few of these and all your rodents will be captured by these uh, by the spotted uh, uh, spotted owl or any of these owl species that are oh, yes. uh, that exist in urban india and everywhere certainly certainly, certainly. and um, you know i think about the work that my friend yossi leshem has done in israel to encourage um, farmers to put up barn owl nesting boxes i mean at rather eye-popping densities. I've visited some of the farms in Israel where Yossi's been working, and they're, you know, like every 30 or 40 meters, there's a, a, a barn owl nesting box on a, on a pole, and they're, they don't need to use 
rodenticides at all to control rodents in their, you know, date palm um, plantations and things of that sort. They've been using, they've been using the owls. And, you know, in many parts of the world, barn owl populations are in steep decline, but they're doing extremely well in, in Israel, in Jordan, and some of the surrounding areas. It's also provided some cross-border, in, in a part of the world where, where political boundaries have been really problematic over the years, it's, 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 it's created a lot of cross-boundary and, and cross-political cooperation um, among, among farmers and, and conservationists. So it's been, you know, it's owl, owls as a tool of diplomacy as well as um, biological control. Absolutely. And uh, like all of us know, birds don't know border. They don't deal with human borders at all. Um, That's true. Uh, my last question for you, and I, I would like after you answer this to end with some sort of benediction. But um, one of the things your book talks about is migratory connectivity. And it seems self-evident. I mean, you always assume that the birds need a connectivity, but talk about it a little bit. What does that mean? Sure. Migratory connectivity is a fairly new concept among um, migratory bird uh, science. And it's the idea that specific regional breeding populations um, connect with distinct regional wintering areas. Um, so in other words, you know, if you have a widespread, a widespread species that breeds across North America and winters across large areas of South America, they're not just sort of randomly going south. It's not like you're pouring water out of one basin and into another and it just all kind of sloshes around in there. You know, for example, one of the species that we study in Alaska is Swainson's thrush, which has a really long migration. They'll, they'll, they'll migrate eight or 9,000 miles one way into southern South America. But some Swainson's thrushes winter as far north as Mexico. So what we have found is that the population of Swainson's thrushes that we, that we study in central Alaska all winter in an extremely narrow band in southern South America, right on the border between Bolivia and Argentina, in a, in a band that's only about 20 or 30 kilometers wide and about 120 kilometers from north to south. Very narrow, elevational band of low mountain forest. So that means if something happens to that forest in that distant part of the world, the thrushes that breed in a, an otherwise protected national park in Alaska in the United States are going to suffer. So understanding these connections is, is going to be absolutely vital for, for protecting and preserving um, all of these populations of migratory birds. And, and, and that, that degree of migratory connectivity, some, some species have very low migratory connectivity. They really, it is like the water just all kind of sloshes around in the, in the new basin. But, but it, increasingly we're finding most birds seem to show a really strong connection between a particular breeding area in the north in a particular breeding area in the south. Or I should also say the reverse. I mean, if, if you're a bird breeding in southern South America or in Australasia and wintering farther to the north, there's probably a strong connectivity there as well. So understanding the entire life cycles of these birds, the routes that they take, the places that they need along the way is going to be absolutely essential for us um, to protect and preserve and, and, and hopefully restore migratory bird populations around the world. Um, the reason I am fascinated by migration, as, uh, bird migration, as are you, Scott, is that it is an incredible issue in every sense of the word. First of all, the birds are incredible. And then the second thing is it's a global issue. Everybody has to work together, come together beyond geographical borders to solve it or preserve. I mean, solve it is a bit of hubris to think that we can do what more than what the birds have done. But I think the whole notion of a global community combined with the notion of birds who don't know global borders is just amazing. Um, but I'd love your take on it before we and I mean, climate change is a big issue and you've alluded to that. But whatever you would like to say as last as the last words. Well, I think you're absolutely right, because one can argue that bird migration connects the world in, in a way that even global weather patterns don't. I mean, you have the, 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 you know, the doldrums around the equator. You know, these, these big storm systems come out of the poles and move toward the equator, but kind of fizzle out. They don't, and yet the birds are going you know, as, you know, from one end of the globe to the other. 
you know, the, the birds that breed in the part of central Alaska where my friends and I are studying them literally fan out over three quarters of the Earth's surface every year. They're, you know, they're, they're traveling to, to southern Asia. They're traveling to Africa. They're traveling to Central and South America. They're traveling across the Pacific. So it's an opportunity for us, as you say, to see the world as it really is, as a single unified place rather than a welter of hundreds of different political divisions. Hmm. Bird migration gives us an opportunity to work across those boundaries and to, to, you know, to see ourselves as, you know, help, helping, helping to preserve the, you know, the natural systems that, that, this, that, this global, that this global migratory phenomenon depends on. And, and, and we're seeing that increasingly. I think people, people recognize that. We're not doing as much as we, as we could. We're not doing as much as we should. But we are making progress. And on that positive note, Scott Weidensall, thank you so much for being a guest in the Bird Podcast. Shobha, it has been an absolute delight. Thank you so much. Bird Podcast is produced by Ulla Sanand and Echo Edu. I'm your host, Shobha Narayan. Thank you for listening.